Lane. <laughs> well, good morning, church. How's everybody today? Good morning. Good morning. As you can probably tell my allergies are going nuts today, so mm -hmm. I'm having a really great time. <clears throat> so just kind of bear with me today. But good morning. Welcome to Grace Street Church. It's a beautiful sunny day outside, blue skies, everything. Uh, it's awesome to have that kind of a start to a day. So if you're online with us this morning, say hi so we know that you're with us. And uh, make sure to watch this morning's announcements as they come up in the feed as well for you today. This Wednesday, we're going to have Bible study again at 7 p.m. And we will be starting a new series coming up here shortly. And that will be on the engagement project from Dr. Del Tackett. And uh, so we'll be getting that, getting all the materials and everything ready. We do have the DVDs, and, and so uh, we're getting that all set and ready to go. It's awesome. It's a follow-up to the Truth Project. And so it's an awesome study. It really is. It, it makes you think of, of who you are and where you are in your relationship to Christ as well. And are you being his hands and feet? So. Uh, our next men's breakfast is going to be May 4th at 9 a.m. Uh, same place as usual here, and I think uh, there's a good possibility we may have biscuits and gravy that day. Uh, so try and join us if you can. Uh, season 19 of Orange Track Racing. We had Orange Track here yesterday, and it was a good time. Uh, had, had some fun races going on there. And, and I know that Jason Dodd had a really great day because he got to sit over in the seat a couple of times over there and get his picture taken. Mm. Uh, he won a couple of races. So May 11th, we're going to have the next uh, uh, Orange Track racing here. And uh, we'll be kind of getting together and taking a look to see what uh, movies we're going to be having for next month as well. So uh, watch for that and make sure that you uh, keep in touch there so we're, we're working on that as well. So. Uh, let's go to God in prayer this morning, shall we? Gracious Lord and Heavenly Father, we just praise you and thank you for this opportunity to gather here together in your name today. Lord, we ask a special blessing for those who couldn't be with us here today if they're traveling uh, or if they're recovering from uh, surgeries or illnesses or injuries. Lord, we just lift them up to you today and we ask for a special blessing to be upon them as well. Travel mercies for those who are traveling today as well. And we uh, just uh, ask that you would have them join us again as soon as they're able. So, Father God, as we come to you today, we, we thank you for the opportunity to worship you, to come together and to learn more about your word and to honor you in being here in your presence today. And we ask a special blessing on Pastor Terry as he gives the message that you laid upon his heart to give today as well. So as we come before you today, we just humble ourselves, open our hearts to receive this message in both word and in music today. Open our ears to hear and our eyes to see the wonders of your world. In Jesus' precious name we pray. Amen. Amen. So this morning's call to worship comes from Isaiah 32, verses 3 and 4, and this is from the New Living Translation. Then the eyes of those who will see will no longer be closed, and the ears of those who will hear listen. The fearful heart will know and understand, and the stammering tongue will be fluent and clear, which I'm surprised this morning that mine's actually fluent and clear. <laughs> but have you ever heard the expression, when we, when we think about this in here, Isaiah was calling us to have a broader vision of our world and, and what was actually going on in it. So have you ever heard that expression used, you can't see the forest through the trees? Oh, yeah. I feel that way sometimes. See, sometimes we fail to see clearly what's right in front of us, right in front of us, and we need to take on a different perspective in order to understand and fully see or actually see clearly what's right before us. Sometimes it actually comes from hearing a different point of view. So Isaiah is telling the people, you know, open your minds, open your eyes to a different perspective to see things and hear things that you may not be used to hearing. Because a lot of times we close ourselves off to differing opinions and then we become very short-sighted, if you will, in the process. 
So Isaiah in this passage is telling, look past what seemingly is right in front of us, what we come to know or become used to seeing in the world around us, to see something even better and special. Isaiah saw the hope of Israel in an ideal king that would rule over them. But this king was no ordinary king. This ruler would be a refuge of the people for God. No human ruler ever fulfilled that vision of a wise, good, God-fearing king. And the doctrine of salvation then teaches us, while well, leaders and people should seek to be that kind of refuge that Isaiah is talking about in here, ultimately only Jesus Christ can perfectly, can perfectly fulfill this hope. I was speaking fluently earlier. <laughs> so he was asking them to look outside of something that they knew for something even better. See, Jesus Christ alone brings that true nobility, that true kinglingship into our world. God is the only true king. All others rule with his permission. The king became flesh in the Messiah, Jesus, and his rule will eventually be established throughout all of the world, through all of the peoples, bringing justice and righteousness, opening people's ears and eyes to heed God's word. And that's what Isaiah is talking about here is opening up our eyes, opening up our minds to accept and <coughs> hear the things that are being taught to us, which may have been completely contrary to what they've been used to for the last 3,000 years. So the king became flesh in the Messiah Jesus, and his rule will be then established, opening up those people's eyes and ears to hear the word of God, putting aside the things that they knew to embrace a new vision of God, a new relationship with God. And only under that messianic king will society recognize people correctly and allow those wise followers to follow him rather than fools who close their minds off to what is right before their eyes. Then all people then will be treated as God desires them to be treated. So he is asking us today then to do that same thing. Open our mind's eye, if you will, to see what God is putting right before us and understand, accept, and then live out that word that God has for us. Let us pray. Gracious Lord, we thank you for this word and, and for this call to worship this morning to prepare our hearts, to prepare our minds, to prepare our eyes to see exactly what we needed to see and what we need to hear to be your disciples here on earth, to follow you more closely, to hear your word and live out your word day to day as you would have us do as your people, your children of God. So we thank you, Lord, for this message, and we thank you for the message that you put on Pastor Terry's heart today to bring forth, to give me your eyes. Let us see what you have for us today. Let us hear what you want us to hear, and let us live it out each and every day. Amen. 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 Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Anybody else going to go change into shorts and go spend some time outside today? Cold and bow. Cold and bow. I don't have that problem just yet. A little bit of shade, but... Um, too loud, thank you. It's always nice to have that right there. All right, well, I, it, before I came, uh, Mark's praying, and, and I, I, I knew I needed to get up, and, and I happened to look outside, and I'm thinking, Lord, give these people your eyes to see the church sign and draw them in. <laughs> But this, this, there's a, a great song by Brandon Heath, which is actually in the playlist today, but that came after the fact. I was actually uh, reading uh, from Luke, and this passage about the two disciples walking to Emmaus has always intrigued me. It's always been 
something that jumps out at me. And um, then I got a, uh, kind of that seal or that stamp by God saying, this is the one I want you to do. There's a, a pastor I follow on social media. And he was talking about this passage and he was talking about was and is. And well, I'll kind of touch on that here in a little bit, but first let's back up a minute because we, we're just two weeks from outside or past Easter. Can you believe it already? Two weeks. In last week's message, Mark uh, answered the question, what does the cross mean for us today? A very pertinent question to be asking immediately following Easter. And what we learned is this, is that the religious leaders did not want to let go of what we know as the Old Testament scriptures or the Old Testament teachings. We learned that the religious leaders wanted to remain between the people and God. They wanted to be that intermediary. They wanted to have, that was their, their perceived purpose in life. It also gave them quite a bit of power. We also learned that because of what Jesus did on the cross, that we can now come boldly and directly to God. And we learned that when we respond to Jesus, we, re we receive renewal, release, redemption, restoration, rescue, and reclamation. Now, for those of you that want to know more about those items and what we just talked about, after the message today, go to our website, click on messages, and go and listen to last week's message. But the beauty of the cross is, is that we are no longer separated from God. But we got to do a couple things. We have to move on from the past. This is where that was came from in this little uh, video that I had watched and listened to. And we have to open our eyes to see that's the is. Because as Pastor Mark taught us last week, faith is the complete trust and confidence in something or someone. We must have complete trust and confidence in Jesus. Today, we're going to look and, and we're going to see, just as the disciples did, that Jesus is alive. And I love it. God keeps putting things in the whole week as I'm studying and preparing. And God puts stories and, and scriptures in front of me. And this is one that I just love. Pastor Nikki Gumbel is a pastor that I follow. Uh, he's, his reading plan, A uh, Year in the Bible, is one that I uh, read each day and, and study from. And he had this story. It's about a young member of his congregation. This is a young member is probably not so young anymore because this is many years ago. But this person had a job working in the library of a major British newspaper. And here's, here's how this story reads. It says, this newspaper kept files of old cuttings about every well-known person. The files were kept in rows of long shelves and were separated into living people and dead people. Now, just by the very statement there of long shelves, we know this is old because it would be digitized now. One day, the young man was looking through the files of dead people and came across a large file marked Jesus Christ. He glanced over, you can just see this, he glanced over his shoulder to check that no one was looking and quickly moved the file from the dead people section to the living people section. Jesus Christ is alive. He is risen from the dead. To anyone looking for him among files of dead people, the angels would say, why do you look for the living among the dead? He is not here. He is risen. Victory is not a dirty word. Jesus is the great victor. As Bishop Leslie Newbigin often said, the resurrection is not the reversal of a defeat, but the manifestation of a victory. The cross was not a defeat. On the cross, Jesus won a great victory for us over sin, death, and the powers of evil. And it makes me think about things. I'm thinking about what happened that during Holy Week from the procession in and this 
grand parade and, and the people cheering Jesus to the point where they were yelling, crucify him to his death and ultimately to his resurrection. Well, that leaves us with an empty tomb. It leaves us with the fact that Jesus' followers were pretty slow to believe that it had actually happened. That the women and not the men were amongst the first to see him. But at first, they didn't recognize him. Mary did not recognize Jesus. By, she thought he was the gardener and said, Sir, what have you done with him? But it wasn't just Mary that did not recognize Jesus. Not then and not now. Luke records the account of two followers walking to Emmaus, and this is the only place that we will find this story in the scriptures. So today we're going to take a look at Luke chapter 24, verses 13 through 34, and we're going to break it up. We're going to start out with verses 13 through 19 to begin with, and this is what Luke writes. He says that the same day, two of Jesus' followers were walking to the village of Emmaus, seven miles from Jerusalem. As they walked along, they were talking about everything that had happened. As they talked and discussed these things, Jesus himself suddenly came and began walking with them. But God kept them from recognizing him. He asked them, what are you discussing so intently as you walk along? They stopped short, sadness written across their faces. Then one of them, Cleopas, replied, you must be the only person in Jerusalem who hasn't heard about all the things that have happened there the last few days. What things, Jesus asked. The things that happened to Jesus, the man from Nazareth, they said. He was a prophet who did powerful miracles, and he was a mighty teacher in the eyes of God and all the people. Catch what they were doing. They were walking away from Jerusalem to Emmaus. Now, Emmaus, there's a couple of different places that could be. There's a couple of different distances that come out. The, the actual location of it doesn't really matter in this story because that's not the point. The point is, is they were withdrawing themselves from what had just happened. This would have been a great time, a wonderful time, a very important time where they should have been with the other believers. Yet they were focused on their own problems, on their own disappointments. Then came Jesus. I can almost hear the tone and the despair in their voice when they respond to Jesus' questions. Especially for the fact that they didn't even recognize who they were talking to. And they said, he was, here's that was again, that he was a prophet. He was a mighty teacher. Did they ever get that wrong? Not the part about being a great teacher or a mighty teacher or, or prophet. That's not the part that they got wrong. They got part the pro wrong when they said was. Because they did not know it was Jesus. I wonder if they probably gave him a quick lesson since he didn't know what had happened. You, you can see people doing this. They had to talk about his miracles. So he turned water into wine. He cured a royal official son. He told Simon to throw his nets out a little farther, and they almost sank the boat. There were so many fish. He healed lepers. He healed a centurion's servant, and he didn't even go to see him. He calmed a storm as the disciples were going across the sea, and he fed thousands. Oh, and his teachings... If you haven't heard these, man, you missed out. He taught us to love our enemies and pray for those who persecute us. 
He taught us how to pray. He said, Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. He told us not to give lip service, but to truly honor him in our hearts. Oh, and he had this, this great parable about these two sons. One who basically said, Dad, you're dead to me. Give me my inheritance now. And yeah, he taught us who a neighbor truly is. But then they go on, and in verse 20 it says, But our leading priests and other religious leaders handed him over to be condemned to death, and they crucified him. We had hoped that he was the Messiah who had come to rescue Israel. This all happened three days ago. The religious leaders, they had been constantly looking for ways to trap Jesus. And the greater his fame grew, the more the people knew about him, the more the people started to follow him, the more they became adamant about finding a way to trip him up so that he could be arrested and they could put a stop to all of it. And they also had it wrong. I mean, and these two disciples aren't any different than the other people. They were expecting the Messiah to set them free from Roman rule. They were expecting a warrior king. They didn't understand what the Messiah needed to come and do. They went on in verse 22 and said, Then some women from our group of his followers were at his tomb early this morning, and they came back with an amazing report. They said his body was missing, and they had seen angels who told them Jesus is alive. Some of our men ran out to see, and sure enough, his body was gone, just as the women had said. Now, in that time, women were looked at very poorly, very lowly. So, of course, the men, being men, had to run out and see for themselves and prove it to themselves that this was exactly what had happened. They're no different than when people hear about the resurrection for the first time. It takes time to process. Jesus' death and resurrection are both real events in human history. And if you want to know more about that, because we're not going to go into that today, there's a couple of good books out there. One is just like a short 96-page book. It's called The Case for the Resurrection. A first-century reporter investigates the story of the cross by Lee Strobel, whom we all know from uh, some previous studies and movies. But some of the things that he quotes in this pamphlet or this short book of his come from a much thicker book, a much more academic book with those big $50 words in it by uh, Gary Habermas and Michael Lacona. And it's entitled The Case for the Resurrection of Jesus. It's very much thicker. It's a good, it, but it's got some great stuff in it. And, and I, if you're looking for something, go out and check out both of those. But just like Mary and, and the disciples, those who first hear about the resurrection for the first time, they, they go through disbelief. They think, oh, this must be a fabricated story. There's no way this is true. But they're doing what we all would do, looking at it from an earthly perspective. <coughs> and if we look at it from that perspective, it's going to be impossible to believe. Because, you can't, well, you can now, you know, you got, we've got the little paddles. We can shock people back to life after a heart attack. But he rose by himself. There was no intervention. And I pray that they don't stop there when they hear about the resurrection story. I pray that they would, just like Lee Strobel did, who was a staunch atheist, he took time and years and he investigated and he found out the facts. 
Now, it's still possible, even after all that, that we could be puzzled by it. It is only when someone personally encounters Jesus Christ that they will truly understand and accept that the resurrection did happen. Our two disciples in this passage are about to have that personal encounter. Starting in verse 25, Then Jesus said to them, You foolish people, you find it so hard to believe all the prophets wrote in the scriptures. Wasn't it clearly predicted that the Messiah would have to suffer all these things before entering his glory? Then Jesus took them through the writings of Moses and all the prophets, explaining from all the scriptures the things concerning himself. By this time, they were nearing Emmaus and the end of their journey. Jesus acted as if he was going on, but they begged him, stay the night with us since it is getting late. So he went home with them, and as they sat down to eat, he took the bread and he blessed it. Then he broke it and gave it to them. And suddenly, their eyes were opened. They recognized him, and at that moment, he disappeared. The, these two disciples' attitude towards Jesus was that of the caring neighbor, just like in the Good Samaritan parable. So we know that they had listened to Jesus' teachings and they took them to heart because they took him in, showed him what a neighbor was. But did you notice what happened in this passage? Especially in this passage, part of it that's sitting up on the screen right now. Where it says this, they sat down to eat. Who took the bread and blessed it? Jesus took the bread and blessed it. The guest became the host. Now each week we talk about the importance of breaking bread together. It reminds us that Jesus' death and resurrection leads us to salvation. It symbolizes unity and creates an unbreakable bond between us. 1 Corinthians 10, 16 and 17 says this, when we bless the cup at the Lord's table, aren't we sharing in the blood of Christ? And when we break the bread, aren't we sharing in the body of Christ? And though we are many, we all eat from one loaf of bread, showing that we are one body. Think about the people of Israel. Weren't they united by eating the sacrifices at the altar? Now there's several of us here in, in, in the the room that have been on something called a walk to a mass, and I know in your head, and if it's not, I'm going to put it in your head. The song that we sang at each gathering, one bread, one body. But this is, this passage from 1 Corinthians 10, it, it puts that stamp at the end of the story, that's, at the end of the teachings that Jesus had just given to those two disciples. Now, he had revealed himself in two ways to them. First, he used the scriptures and taken through the writings of Moses and all the prophets. Now, we all like a good Bible study. But this had to have been one epic study. And certainly one that, sorry, Mark, neither one of us are ever going to be able to top or even come close to, because it was Jesus himself. Can you imagine what it must have been like to hear Jesus explain everything that the scripture said concerning himself? I know that when I read and when I study and when I come across something that just literally jumps off of the page, my heart burns. My mind races. I start looking through my, my Bible going, okay, so that reminds me of this, and then I, I've got, literally I can't find enough bookmarks, so I have torn pieces of paper that I have shoved in my study Bible. As I go back and forth, and I end up spending a half hour on a single verse. Here they have gone through all the teachings of the old of what we call the Old Testament to see the connection straight to Jesus. 
And when that happens, it's as if the words are of God are speaking directly to me, just as Jesus spoke directly to them. It's in those moments that I feel like they, those two did. That takes us to verse 32. They said to another, to each other, didn't our hearts burn within us as we talked, as he talked with us on the road and explained the scriptures to us? And within the hour, they were on their way back to Jerusalem. They found the 11 disciples and the others who had gathered with them, who said, the Lord has really risen. He appeared to Peter. We only get a small taste of what they did. We only get a small taste when we listen to someone who takes the scriptures and explains them to us. And, and Mark will tell you this as much as I will. We need that same teaching just as much as anyone else does. And I know for myself, I watch and listen to several pastors throughout the week to get fed because I can't bring and come back in here and feed you if my tank is empty. The second way that Jesus revealed himself was when he broke bread with them. That's when their eyes were opened. God had masked their eyes and not allowed them to see that it was Jesus because he had something else for them. He had to teach them. It goes to uh, something that I was reading a couple of days ago when it talks about it, it basically it's like a farmer. He's out in his field and he's walking through the livestock and he hasn't cleaned up after the livestock yet so he's standing in manure. And sometimes it feels like our life is like that. Like that's all that's around us. But here's the thing is we're going through that that manure is feeding the ground. And it's something beautiful is going to rise up because of it. Some people say when we go through a test that gives us a testimony, it gives us something that we can take and use from our lives with someone else who's going through the same thing so that we can empathize with them and help them through whatever they're going through. It's through the scriptures and through communion that we encounter Jesus. And we go back, let's go back to the very beginning when I said we must have complete trust and confidence in Jesus. The exact words that Mark said last week. Imagine what the two disciples were thinking. Their minds had to have been racing. What they were feeling. Do you ever get that, when you have this revelation, your body just tingles? I can't even begin to imagine what they were thinking and feeling. But think about how you feel when you hear God's word and it's explained to you. You'll have that aha moment. Jesus was slow in revealing himself to them. It drives home the fact that we have to trust in God's word. After their eyes were open, they could barely contain themselves. And this road would not have been safe after dark. Yet, yeah, boom, they're back on the road and they're headed back to Jerusalem. They're back, going back to see the other believers, back to the, the other, to the eleven disciples. They couldn't keep it to themselves. They had to have been thinking of a teaching that Jesus gave on the Sermon on the Mount. If we look at Matthew 5, 14 and 16, it says, You are the light of the world, like a city on a hilltop that cannot be hidden. No one lights a lamp and then puts it under a basket. Instead, a lamp is placed on a stand where it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way that your good deeds shine out for all to see, so that everyone will praise your Heavenly Father. 
we have to stop looking back at what we're leaving behind and look forward to what God has for us. We have to get out of the was and into the is. Now, don't know if this is part of what Jesus was revealing to them, but I thought of Lot's wife as I was going through this. What did she do? She didn't listen. She turned back and looked. She's not the only one that does that. We all do that. The Israelites did that throughout their journey through the desert on their way to the promised land. They kept remembering what they had in Egypt. They had, well, we had fish. We had things to eat. Not remembering how awful their life was. And they were not remembering what God was promising. Oh, and then once the religious leaders get a hold of them, even more burdens are placed on them. 600 more burdens are placed on them. If we are continually looking back, if we're t continually going back and picking up the things that we've already turned over to Jesus, we're weighing ourselves down. Now put all the burdens that our daily lives put on us. Is it any wonder that we get so weighed down? I think that's why Jesus says this in Matthew 11. Come to me, all of you who are weary and carry heavy burdens, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you. Let me teach you because I am humble and gentle at heart. You will find rest for your souls, for my yoke is easy to bear, and the burdens I give you is light. Jesus is telling us that by giving up all that junk, all that crap, that the yoke he has for us will give us rest for our souls. When we open ourselves up, letting the Holy Spirit guide us as Jesus guided his followers, he will give us eyes to see and ears to hear. That's why I chose that passage from Isaiah for this morning. It's called the worship. Then the eyes of those who will, who see will no longer be closed. The ears of those who hear will listen. The fearful heart will know and understand. And the stammering tongue will be fluent and clearer. Our identity is in Christ. We need to show the world who Christ is. And I'll leave you with this quote from A.W. Tozer. It says, we can all get caught up in the nuances of religion and miss the glorious joy of following after Christ. Whatever hinders us in our journey must be dealt a death blow. Mark and I were talking about a couple of ministries this morning that they've sucked the people in, they gave them some entertainment, they put on a show, and then the sheep's clothing comes off and the wolf is there Satan is hiding in plain sight he wants us to be concerned about all these nuances of religion and forget that it's about a relationship in an article I read this week it was talking about changing a mindset from religion to relationship and they basically said after thousands hundreds and thousands of years that's going to be near impossible but that's the important part Jesus opened their eyes after he had taught them and they were they saw and they were excited and they were even as tired as they probably were they probably went at a very it, they weren't running they might have been doing that, like that Olympic run walk. Have you ever seen the run walk? It's, it's kind of funny to watch. But they were hustling back to Jerusalem to the other believers because they couldn't keep it hidden. Father God, don't let us keep the message that you've given us of our redemption, our restoral through what Jesus did on the cross for us. Father, we thank you so much that you gave us your son that he died on the cross, that if we open our hearts and open our minds and open our ears, open our eyes, that we will understand, we will see, and we will have that beautiful, eternal relationship. 
Father, we just thank you and we praise you. And all God's children said, Amen. Amen. Thank you, Pastor Terry. As we prepare for our time of communion this morning, as the graphic tells us on the screen up here, we are to do this in remembrance of him. And so as Cleopas, Peter, and uh, one of the other disciples was walking along um, to the, on the road to Emmaus, and Jesus appeared to him, he took them back through the scriptures because as we all know Peter denied Christ three times and they were describing who he was and what he had done to this perfect stranger but still in all they didn't recognize him they were being called to remember their eyes were being opened their ears were hearing his words and as he walked them through all the scriptures and all their history, he was causing them to remember who they were and where they came from. See, that's building the foundation of the relationship with Christ. Remembering what he had done, remembering who he was, remembering that he fulfilled those prophecies. He fulfilled those things so that they knew that he was who he said he was and he could do what he said he could do. That's the foundation of our religion and that's the foundation of the cross for us today. So, as we come into this time of communion today, on the night that he was betrayed, Jesus took bread and he broke it and he said, take and eat. This is my body, which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And likewise, later on in the meal, he took the cup, and after he had filled it, he said, This is the cup of the new covenant, my blood shed for you and for many, for the forgiveness of sins. And he tells us that each time that we are to gather together, we are to do these things. We are to break bread and drink of the cup in remembrance of him, to remember the foundation of our religion, of who we are, and what he has done, what he had fulfilled in the scriptures, as we come together in communion with each other. The body of Christ broken for you. The blood of Christ shed for you. Well, I guess I get to be Denise again today as they're traveling for us today. Do we have any other prayers or prayer concerns that we need to lift up today? Any spoken out other than what we cover on Wednesday nights in here? Any Peace new stuff earth. coming through? Peace on earth. Always. Peace on earth, absolutely. We need that. I would say just uh, Israel has been under attack for the last yes. 24 hours from our own, so. Yes. So... Uh, we do want to lift up Israel, and uh, uh, I was talking to a friend down in, in Dallas this week, and uh, she's actually leaving her church because uh, she brought up the fact that Iran had attacked Israel and was, was sending in drones to attack Israel directly now. And so she told the pastor when they were there on Wednesday night that, you know, we really need to lift them up in prayer. And he's, it's too controversial. So I'll, I'll do that separately, privately, but I won't bring that up. We are as a church, the people of God, called to support God's people everywhere. Everywhere. And so this is the time that we need to lift these people up. We need to edify them, lift them up out of the situation that they are in. That's what we are called to do. We have to do our part. Jesus has done his part. God has done his part. 
We have to do our part to be his hands and feet, to be his eyes and ears, to lift everyone up. So as I started today, I talked about people who had, who are recovering from illnesses and injuries and surgeries and procedures and those have yet to go in to have things uh, repaired to go to the great physician. So as we come into this time here, let us remember all those who are hurting in this world today. We lift them up to you, Lord God, and we, we ask your mighty blessing upon them. Your love is strong enough and large enough to to completely engulf the entire world, and we lift that up to you today. We lift this up to you, Lord, that those who are hurting, those who need you, those to, that need to hear your voice, let us speak it to them. Embolden us to be your hands and feet, and to bring them into a relationship with you. Lord, we know that your time of coming is, is coming closer and closer. We can see it in the signs and in the world today. And so, Lord, we just ask that you would help us to be that guiding light, that, that light that's on top of the hill for everyone to see, be drawn to you, be drawn back into a relationship with you, that they would no longer be separated. Father God, we praise you and thank you for this opportunity to gather here together as your church, your family, to lift each other up and to edify each other in your word. Keep us from those false prophets that are out there and from the false teachings that are seem to be everywhere in this world today and proliferating across the, the internet and those things that, that uh, you know, haven't proved themselves out over the millennia to be true. Shield us and guard our hearts from those things that would separate us then from you by listening to those false teachings. So, Father God, we just ask today for that purity of heart, for a purity of spirit. And we ask, Lord, that you would grant us then the ability to go forth in your name and to bring others into you. We ask for traveling mercies for those who are heading back home. We ask, Lord, that you would just lift up those who are hurting, uh, those who have been lifted up in both word and in writing and upon our hearts and unspoken today that we can reach all those that need to hear your voice that need to be lifted up in your name today in jesus name we pray amen, amen. Thank you all for joining us. We are glad that you're with us. For those of you online, the link has been put into the chat a couple of times this morning for the music. In there, you'll find uh, the music, uh, the announcement reel, as well as a trailer for the engagement project. So you too can see uh, what we are about to embark on in this wonderful study. Pray with me. Gracious Lord, I pray that each of us will have a pure heart and a trusting spirit. Father, you redeemed us by sending your one and only Son so that we could have eternal life. Let the Holy Spirit continue to work in and through us. I pray that your word, which is written on our hearts, would cause our hearts to burn as it did with the two disciples as they walked along the road to Emmaus with Jesus. Lord, our world needs a repentance and a transformation. I pray that this would then lead to a revival like none other in all of history. Thank you, Father, for your incredible victory over sin and death. I ask you right now to remove Satan and all the powers of evil from our homes, our relationships, our families, Lord, from every single aspect of our lives. Thank you for the victory. In Jesus' name, amen.